I decided after many years to try a Windows experiment to see whether I can develop effectively in Go on Windows. Um, I waited a year because my laptop had a year's warranty worth. <laughs> and after the year was up, back to Linux. I'm running Ubuntu here, anyway. All right, so um, the, this talk is called Hakka Roundhouse. And that's a Hakka Roundhouse. Well, those are a number of Hakka Roundhouses. Um, it's actually a Western term, Hakka Roundhouse. The Chinese don't call it a Hakka Roundhouse. They call it a Tulo, which means earth building. Um, and if you inspect, that is the description of a monolith. Agree? That is a description of a building monolith. And we have a number of monoliths built close to each other. And that's the inspiration of this new, not a design pattern, implementation pattern which I'm playing with, uh, which I will be putting into production for my next project. Um, a bit about myself. I write talks because I want to clarify my own thinking. I put them down into a presentation and you guys are my guinea pigs, so please give feedback, <laughs> feedback to me. Um, anyway, in a, Haraka, in a Hakka roundhouse, they've got tens of families, um, 20, 30, 40 families living under the same roof. And there's a clan chief that rules the entire monolith. Uh, their concept is it's closed to the outside and it's three stories high. It doesn't look three stories high, but it is three stories high. The walls are like three meters thick, 10 feet thick walls. So it's a fort, effectively it's a fort. So it protects outsiders from coming in and the insiders can go around their business very efficiently. So it's open on the inside. And if there are issues within that community, within a, in, within a roundhouse, uh, they bring their grievances to the clan chief and the clan chief's decision is final. That's it. It's settled one way or the other. Um, but if you have issues with other roundhouses, this roundhouse is an issue with this roundhouse, then it's going to be a problem because they are ruled by different clan chiefs, or different chiefs. Uh, and that's why wars occur. Um, so, what are the pros and cons of software monoliths? I can name a lot of cons. Big ball of mud, cannot be extended, uh, that kind of stuff. Can anybody name me a pro? Does anybody? Yeah, please. Okay, no worries, no, no pressure. Does anybody here program? Yeah. I mean, you can reuse common library or utility stuff. Yep. And it's all linked. All the earliest languages like C, for example, um, drew upon very many libraries and they're all linked to a common deliverable binary. And they were monoliths. Um, I think the major pro of a monolith is there's one thing to take care of. There may be many components, but they get linked and there's one deliverable that you deliver into production to take care of. Compared with microservices. Who thinks microservices are a good thing? I, I think so. I think most people, I think it's fashionable. Microservices are very fashionable these days. And monoliths have gone out of fashion. So I don't know why I'm talking, up, talking about monoliths right now, but I can hope to convince you that it's a good way to start. <clears throat> anyway, pros and cons of monoliths. Monoliths have plenty of cons. And I'm going to show you all the pros later as we develop. So let's go through a few questions in our minds. Can multiple software modules happily live together under the same monolith? Can, cannot? Can. Should these modules, these software modules, live in the same software repo? They can. In a project, they should, but they don't have to. They can be from different libraries. 
Anybody disagree that communications within a monolith is fast and reliable? Assuming all engineering is the same, yes. Intra-process intra communication typically is fast and reliable. Unless the whole process dies, then you've got no communication at all. But communication outside of the monolith, one roundhouse talking to another separate roundhouse, it depends on the network. And some networks are very good, some networks are not so good, but with networks come a lack of guarantees. Response times, latencies, uh, stuff like that. So, when a monolith outgrows its function, when a particular family in a Hakka roundhouse becomes very successful, trying to topple the chief, right? what does the chief do? The chief takes this successful family, he kicks him out. <laughs> Start your own roundhouse. I mean, friendly kick him out. Start your own roundhouse. Start your own clan. Start your own organization. Right? And these were my inspiration to create a new style monolith. So can we build microservice ready monoliths? Let's go. And first I'll make a statement. Uh, how many of you here are new to Go? As in, oh, quite a few. Okay, I'll go slowly. Uh, new to Go. Bold Go means Go language. It has, one of the things that attracted me to Go language is it's got this thing called Go routines. And Go routines are things it's, it's, it, that name is derived from core routine, which is cooperative multitasking routine. In other words, um, James and I were sharing the projector just now. James was uh, giving the introduction to Traveloka. He was taking the resource of the projector, and the moment he said, yeah, I'm done, let me hand the resource over to me. So the Go routine Suyin took over the resource and executed it. We only had one screen, or one set of screens, but multiple Go routines can use a single thread of execution. So Go routines are not threads in a normal sense. Go routines are many, many, many people cooperatively sharing a single thread. So as a result, a four core processor like I have in here can have four threads of execution because it's got four workers, four CPUs. But each CPU, because Go routines are so efficient, can handle tens of thousands of Go routines. So, you can have 40,000, 50,000. Uh, Robert Pike, in his uh, presentation, I think, built a million Go routines on his laptop and presented it. Yeah, and it worked. So Go has this thing called Go routines. And Go routines can communicate with each other using what Go calls a channel. So think of a channel as a drain, literally a drain, where you can shove some sort of object down the drain from one Go routine to another Go routine. Um, another fashionable project is gRPC. Has anybody heard of gRPC? Yeah, what does gRPC stand for? <laughs> gRPC remote procedure call. <laughs> okay, it's a, re it's, it's a remote procedure call library, which means um, um, you can uh, call a function as though it is a local function, as though it is a function you have written in your monolith, your traditional monolith, but over the network. So that is a remote procedure call. And uh, it's fashionable because it is fast, it is efficient, uh, it is not exclusive, in other words, it's not snobbish. Because even though it speaks Go, gRPC speaks Go very well, it also speaks Java, it also speaks Python, it also speaks Ruby. Right? So all these different communities can speak gRPC uh, and interoperate with each other. And gRPC is a complicated thing. Um, it is not a simple library where you just link in stuff. GRPC is a bit complicated. So you need to have a, a protocol compiler, a, a, 
interface compiler, they call it Proto-C. Um, so that Proto-C tool will generate two things, two sets of things. The first thing it will generate is the things you pass down the channels, the messages. So you generate the message types um, in the language of your choice. Um, you can generate message types for Go, Java, Ruby, Python, what have you. And not only does it generate message types, it also generates function stubs. So a subroutine call would have a subroutine name and Proto-C, Proto-C compiler would generate function stubs. No implementation yet, but at least the declarations are there. So how can we use these message types uh, in our Go routines? And what do we do with those function stubs? So I'll answer those questions. I'll sit down now <coughs> and I'll demonstrate a traditional monolith. So if I run the program, the traditional monolith says print f2 plus 3 equals dollar $V, by the way, for those C guys and Java guys, uh, is value. So 2 plus 3, the value of 2 plus 3 is the sum of 2 and 3, which is, hopefully it's correct, 5. And the sum of 2 and 3 is defined here. Go has this funny thing called a reverse declaration syntax. In Java, you put int A. In Go, you say A int. So it's upside down, you need to have a bit of a gear shifting when you first start with it, but uh, once you get used to it, it's natural. And return A plus B. So Go also has a, a funny convention. And the funny convention is anything with a lowercase is local, private. And anything with an uppercase, just like my name, SIU, S-I-U, capital S-I-U, is a name. It's exposed. It's a public function. So sum is a private function. So why do many monoliths, not all, many, typically grow into big unmanageable messes? The clue is here. Let's look at the function signature. Is there any constraint in the function signature? You can write anything you want. It's completely free, up to you to define the function signature and up to you to define the, the return type. Completely free. And what happens when there's too much freedom? You get chaos when there's too much freedom. So in a small project, freedom is good because it gives you the freedom to do stuff. But as the project gets big and gets old, you forgot stuff which other people had done. But obviously, you don't know what other people have done. So because there's too much freedom, monoliths get into a mess. So how do we fix this major problem? So I think we can fix this problem using the Hakka Roundhouse monolith. And the Hakka Roundhouse monolith looks like this. This is a Go program. And it starts by saying, starts by saying, this is the main package, which is where the main function lives, which is the entry point for that monolith. And in Go, the statement to import libraries is called import. So you import two libraries. You import the FMT. Uh, the Go community calls it FMT. It just doesn't sound right. I call it FMT or format the FMT format library and this very, 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 very long thing which I wrote yeah, not quite, but I caused it to be written which I decide to give it a short name called PB so this very, very long thing is contracted and I, I refer to it as PB short for protocol buffer uh, and this very, 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 very long thing is generated by Proto-C. So this thing is a comment, but not really a comment. This is a executable comment. <laughs> um, there's a tool called Go Generate, which I'll show you in a while. But that Go Generate tool will look at this comment and say, ah, 
you're asking me whenever I compile this program, whenever you ask me to run Go generate on this program, to run this command line and generate this thing for me. So um, this is normal stuff. Capital P print line means I'm pulling in an exported function of the format library. The result is the sum of the reference of PB, PB's apostrophe S, sum request method, which comprises of two parameters, the parameter called A and the parameter called B, the arguments of which are 2 and 3, and it returns this thing called a res, whatever that is, we don't know yet. But res has this thing inside res called result, which we'll find out what it is in, in a second. But essentially that function here is in such, you can guess, it's, it's two integers. It sums two integers and returns the integer. <coughs> so ignore this PB stuff for a while. What is the function signature? It's this A part, B part, it's a single thing. It's one thing. And the return thing is one thing. Is there by by using one thing here function thing and return thing to the thing inside thing can be as complex as you want and the return can be as complex as you want do we lose any loss of freedom what do you think? We certainly lose freedom because in the past we could declare anything we want. Now we can only declare one thing and returns only one thing. But we don't lose capability. So we lose freedom, we are constrained, but we do not lose capability. So there is constraints. GRPC enforces constraints on us. The same way your parents say, eat your vegetables. So GRPC is like a, is a caring parent that says don't, don't spread your parameters all over the place, put them in one thing and return only one thing. But there is no loss of capability. So let's talk about protocol buffers. So this code here uses a brand new feature, well not brand new, it's out since 1.10, it's experimental since 1.10 called Go modules. For those of you new to Go, which I see quite a few of you are, Go never had an official package manager and never had an de official dependency manager. This is an experiment to define an official dependency manager. They had Go that before, they decided that that was the wrong way to go, so now they have this dependency manager called Go modules. And I declare my entire software, which is only one monolith, but my entire set of software as uh, a presentation dealing with Hakka Roundhouse. And I'm going to put it on GitHub under my account. And I'm going to call that whole module, the entire module, modules, GitHub, Suyin, whatever. So the first thing we need to do is we need to download and extract the protocol compiler, the Proto-C. So this is where you can find it. You pull down Proto-C for your platform. It's available in Windows, Mac, Linux. So I pull down because I'm running Linux, the Linux version. And you need to tell Go modules about the gRPC dependencies. So tell Go that you're using gRPC. So that's the first line. And the second line is tell Go modules that you're using this Proto C generator for Go. So those are the two external dependencies. Now, if you have gone to github.com, see in blah, 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 and um, downloaded that software, clone that repo, with Go modules, all you need to do is Go mod download, and you'll pull down all the dependencies, just like bundle install for those people in Ruby. Right? Uh, or Maven, what's the thing called? I can't remember even what. Yeah, all right. It's that kind of function, that kind of feature. 
So there is something you have to write, a protocol buffer proto definition. And it defines the interface between servers and clients. So in our case, we are not yet defining a remote service, but we are going to use the message types. So the first thing you do is you think about what should you name the module. Since I'm dealing with arithmetic that deals with sums, multiply, divide, I call the module arithmetic. And arithmetic is a long name, so I just call it A-R-I-T-H, arith. So protocol three version. There are two messages which I'm going to define. I define that. The message called sum request. A is an inter integer 32, a 32-bit 32 integer. You can have in 64, but I decide to have an in 32, big enough for me. Equals one is not an assignment. Equals one is not an assignment. In my view, they did a big disservice by using the equal sign. It just says, uh, this should be in slot number one. This should be in slot number one, that's all. And B should be in slot number two. That's what it means. Slot number one, slot number two. Why? Uh, because these people who invented gRPC, the Google folks, know that your messages are not going to stay like this forever. So they decide to make it able to grow. So you can go into different slots and it won't conflict with each other. All right. Learn more about it if you're interested. But anyway, the response has only one slot. Slot number one, which is an in32, it's called result. Note also that I use lowercase a and lowercase b and lowercase result. But Go, because of its conventions, exported functions, capitalized it automatically. Well, Go didn't do it. The, the protocol generator for Go did that for me. So it's automatic. In Ruby or in Java or in Python, it will remain lowercase. It's idiomatic for your language. So, Let's go and do it. Let's go and run this function. Uh, uh, control V C. So I've just copied that, that command line. And when I run it, like any good Unix feature, it doesn't say anything. But it's actually <laughs> but it's actually generated a file for me. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, those, those people working in Windows, they see all fancy, fancy clocks, whatever, uh, anyway. But anyway, let's explain the thing before I show you the output. Capital minus I, or minus capital I, is include folders, include this folder. Um, and the output should be passed through, the output should be passed through the gRPC plugin for Go to generate the output stub. Um, so let's look at what I've generated. So I'm looking at a, the proto subfolder here, the subdirectory. This is the file I put in. So this was written 15 October. And this was the file that was generated today, just now. Uh, I'm time of 11.42 UTC. So my, my laptop runs UTC. So it generates this Go source file for you. And if you're using Ruby, it generates a Ruby file. If you're using Java, it generates a Java file. Um, but instead of looking inside the file and get distracted, I'll show you how to use it first. You have already seen all this. Let's go and run it. So the nice thing about Go, let me just clear this screen so that the nice thing about Go is it's a compiled language, but you can run it as though it is an interpreter and it interprets really, really quickly. So when I run this command, it's going to look at that source file, main.go, compile it, stick it in a temporary folder somewhere, the compiled binary, and execute that binary. How long do you think it's going to take? It's pretty long. Why?
it took 2.2 seconds. Actually, actually the, the first time took longer, second time shorter because Go catches, caches by uh, compilations. What it's doing is pulling in the whole gRPC world uh, and linking all those libraries and generating one single static binary. And it took two seconds. And you have a, a monolith that can now add two numbers. Uh, nothing great. That's not a service. That's a, that's a monolith. That's not a service. Let's make it a service. So to make it a service, let's, have, let's create two things. Let's create the service itself, but we also need to create a load generator for testing. So let me go through this program slowly. Um, the first thing I do is I'm going to make the channel. Remember, a channel is a, a drain where you can, you can put types through the drain. You can put integers, you can put user-defined types through that channel. So I'm going to make a channel comprising of some requests. PB dot some request means PB's apostrophe S some request. And not the actual some request itself, a reference to the some request. So you're just moving pointers around is very efficient. And that channel is going to be named the request channel, request ch. And load gen will take in request ch and uh, is, is this too basic for you guys? Should I go faster? Okay, let's go faster. So essentially, uh, some service takes in request channel and outputs a response channel. And this response channel can be read from and printed out. And we have two services here, a load generator service and a sum service that adds up to integers. Let's look at those services. So the load generator runs as a Go routine. The load generator runs as a Go routine. What this means is it doesn't block the main line. Those people working in Node.js, blocking is a sin. You have any operation that blocks the main line is a sin. Your entire program stops. This is a blocking operation put into a Go routine so that it doesn't block the main line. So it is a, a much nicer way of writing a separate process, quote unquote, within a program without blocking the main program. So all it does is generate two random integers. It's calling the random library, R-A-N-D library, integer n from 0 to up to 99. So it can give you 0 to 99. Um, and what it does is it puts that generated request into the channel. That's all it does. That's all this load generator function does. And it sleeps for one second and it goes over and over again forever. Forever. The sum service, what it does is another Go routine. So now you've got two separate Go routines running under the roundhouse. You have a roundhouse. Think of two families living next to each other doing their stuff independently, but communicating using a channel. And what this sum service does, all it does is it reads from the request channel and it adds two numbers and returns it to another channel. So it takes the thing, adds it together, shove it on our channel. So two families connected via pipes or channels. So let's go and run this service. So when I run that service, it does that. So this is one roundhouse, two families talking to each other, one creating a pair of numbers and another adding them together and sending it out to the clan chief and the clan chief takes all the credit by printing it out to the screen. One roundhouse doing this. Independent Go routines communic communicating. Nice, right? Let's cancel this. So let's 
pretend we're going to deploy. Let's pretend we're going to deploy. So let me explain this command line. C go enable equals zero means build me a completely statically linked binary with no external dependencies. This is not necessarily a good thing, but it's something which I do. Um, you actually sometimes want the external dependencies of C library and all that for language, um, locality. But for our purpose, this is a completely independent uh, binary. So if I use the file utility to see what kind of thing HS is, it's a 64-bit binary, um, least significant bit first, um, statically linked, not stripped for Linux. So I can take this stuff and go to any Linux computer and you will run. No other dependencies needed. No bundle install, no npm whatever, npm install. Just take this binary, run it, it's done. It's completely self-contained. But then you ask, eh, my boss says must run Windows la. <laughs> okay, I'm running a uh, I'm running a Linux laptop here. It generates Linux binaries. Now I'm saying cross compile to Windows. Cross compile to Windows for Windows 64 bit Windows. You can cross compile to 32 bit Windows if anybody still uses it. And that's going to take a few seconds, all of three seconds. And now I have an MS window executable. I can take this single exe file, go to any modern 64-bit Windows machine, and it will run. And you can target Darwin, Mac, you can target ARM, you can target a whole bunch of things. So my statement is, this fulfills the promise of Java. It's a self-contained jar. It's a fat jar with all the libraries compiled in within itself. With no dependencies, for JARs, you still need a JVM. But for Windows, no JVM needed. You just need the machine and the OS, of course. How big is it? The Linux binary is 9.9 .9 megabytes because it's not stripped. And the Windows binary is 9.6 megabytes because it's stripped. Stripped of debugging symbols. That's what stripped means. Nothing to do with striptees. Okay. So for the price of a 10 megabyte executable, you've got a completely independent self gRPC enabled monolith. Any questions? Just interrupt me. Any questions right now? Okay. Yeah. Just to make sure I understand this, uh, if we are extracting the microservice, if you the monolith with gRPC uh, completely. That's what we're going to talk about next. Right now, we have a monolith. Mm -hmm. Two families in a roundhouse talking to each other via channels. What happens when this family gets very successful and the chief kicks him out? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about next. One of the families get very successful. We want to kick him out so they can start his own roundhouse in the context of computing so that we can scale that service. Right? So that we can scale that and that service alone. We don't want to scale the roundhouse. It's very big and you don't want to scale the whole monolith. You want to scale that service. So let's extract the service. Let's extract the sum service. And let's go through how to do it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to define the RPC. Uh, there are seats in the middle. Uh, why don't you take a seat? Or oh, you feel like standing? Okay, no problem. So we have to define the sum service and implement the sum microservice and update the monolith to call now over the network, the evil network, sum service. So how do you find, define the RPC, the remote procedure call? Quite simply, like this. What this means is the arithmetic service can have many functions. One of them is called sum. I only declare one function. 
but it can have many. It could have multiplied in, in there. It could have divided in there, but only de define sum. And sum takes in a sum request and returns sum response. As easy it can, as can be. And sum request and sum response you have seen before. A and B and, uh, and the re return result. So, I create a new file called the service name. I actually call it Hakka Service 2. Uh, main, it's a new monolith, so it's got kicked out of the roundhouse. It's creating its own roundhouse. So it has its own main program. And we have a, the Go Generate. But because it's talking over the network, we must define what port it's talking over. So this service, I decided that it will listen I decided, you can choose your own port, I decided it will be listening on port 551 on all interfaces, local host, network interface 1, network interface 2, network interface N, if I've got N network interfaces. I'll listen to all the incoming network interfaces for port 5051 and do something with the messages I receive. That's what it means. Um, now this is something Go specific. In Java you have classes. Um, in C sharp you have classes. In C plus plus you have classes. Go doesn't have classes. Go does not have classes. Go has a glorified struct. Go has a glorified struct. But you can declare methods on the structs, so it behaves almost like a class. So here I'm declaring an empty struct, a class with no member functions, an empty struct. That's what open curly, close curly means. And here's how you define a method on that struct. So S, which is a parameter name, is a pointer to server. And the parameters for Go takes in this funny thing called context, I'll explain in a while, a sum request and returns two things. So it takes in a sum request and returns two things. It returns a sum response and an error status. So I'm going to go slow here because for those people new to Go, this is the Go gold mine. This is the Go gold mine. Okay. So it takes a context and a request and returns a response and status. What is a context? Anytime you deal with a network, uh, you have to consider things like what if the server takes too long? Timeouts. So you can specify timeouts in a context. It's an automatic circuit breaker. If the process is going to take too long, it's going to kill the process and return. And it's not going to eat up all your CPU and eat up all your memory and kill your servers. So by using contexts, you can build in, build in circuit breakers if you like almost like built-in circuit breakers. Very, very powerful concept. It can be used for other things as well, but timeouts uh, are one of the most important things context can be used for. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, it's not the subject of this talk, but know that it exists. So, how am I going to implement the server? But before implementing the server, let's look at the... Now we're back into a roundhouse. Eh? The roundhouse is going to call the external service. So we are now back in the roundhouse. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We are still not back in the roundhouse. We are now at the, the server's implementation. We create a new server. We register the server internally, declare that the server is coming up. We have this something to do with reflection so that it can tell what the parameters are. Um, and if you are unable to start the server, it shows an error message saying, my server refused to start. But if its server starts properly, it will say gRPC server. All right? So let's run our gRPC server. The server is running. If I didn't put a print line statement, nothing shows. Typical Unix fashion. So let's update the service. Here is a Go routine. So inside a family in a Hakka roundhouse, read something from request channel, call gRPC sum. So call that remote thing.
call the remote thing and the remote thing will return two things a result and an error status if my error status is not nil that means there's an error in there right do something about it why am i going to do something about it i'm not going to do anything i'm going to print it out and say i receive an error but that's the other thing we go some people find this irritating like hell because errors in go are in your face i'm going to give you an error you programmer god decide what to do with the error you can choose to ignore it up to you you can choose to do something about it but you have to make a conscious decision of what to do with it so i made a conscious decision of just printing it out some people in you see a lot of code where you see an underscore there instead of error it means i don't want to know about it if there's an error i don't want to know about it let the program crash uh erlang does that by the way let it crash let it burn anyway go forces you to consider errors so what is grpc some like here is my address my port it's listening to port 5051 but now uh i need to call local host i need to call a specific ip address in this case my computer is talking within the computer so i'm going to call local host port 50 551 and i'm going to ask grpc to make the connection for me um once grpc has made the connection for me i got a connection object if it cannot connect properly it returns an error so go forces you to decide what to do i decide to say just print it out could not connect to the server then you create a new client pb new arithmetic client connection now who wrote this program who do you think wrote this program did i write this program the proto c generator compiled this program for me for free so i don't have to write this program the proto c compiler generated this program for me but i had to write this program c.sum because that's the implementation to add two numbers together context background means I'm not going to tell you anything about timeouts and all that. It's the default context. And I'm going to send in my request and return the result. So 0 and 1, who do you call? 2 is actually create a client object and execute that client object's sum function and you get a result. So let's run this thing. So my server is still running up here. I'm going to run this. And the same thing happens. Let's kill the server, shall we? Control C. Server die. So I killed the server. Notice the error messages. Can the back row see? Is the text big enough? Okay, notice the error messages. Could not compute sum. Sum service. GRPC knows about sum service. Huh? I wrote the error message. I wrote the error message saying sum service could not compute sum. Then I tagged on grpc's error message which says rpc error unavailable description all sub connections are in transient failure latest connection. So this is why go forces the error in your face. It makes you write meaningful error messages. So now I immediately know it's my sum service that has this error. Let's uh revive that service shall we so when the service comes up again it's back to normal i don't have to restart the client nothing it's back to normal so that's why i like grpc and we have created a monolith calling an external service that can be independently scaled so i can have a, a thousand instances of this sum service and it's fine Good. A lot. The biggest overhead is what? What's the biggest overhead? The network. The network. Cannot. <laughs> Cannot turbo. So if you if you don't want latency, what do you do? Keep it a monolith. But you want the scale. Bochap. Bochap means no choice. must have a external 
uh, service. Okay. So RPCs, let's talk about synchronous versus asynchronous. RPCs are synchronous. Remote procedure calls are like telephone calls. I hate telephone calls. Nowadays, I turn on my phone. I hate telephone calls because they interrupt my flow of thought. And, hello, Tekchun, are you there? Wait. Yeah, okay, Tekchun says something. Uh, can, Tekchun, can you do this for me? Wait. Tekchun says, can, cannot. It is blocking. RPCs are blocking. Google decides blocking is good. I disagree. There's another kind of school of thought called event sourcing where it works at event-driven systems, where it works like email. I love email. Why do I love email? People can send me email, I can choose not to read it until I choose to read it. Right? So I choose to read email, uh, okay, go through my email box, it makes my, I make all my replies, then I go away, I don't read it again. It's asynchronous. I, we don't have to plan for a meeting. I send him an email, to tell him to do something or he sends me an email to tell me to do something and we can read it at our own time. So the event-driven architectures are very, very powerful. That's what, Ape Apache, that's what Apache Kafka is all about. And last meetup, I gave a talk on net streaming. That's what event sourcing is all about. So what should you do? Which do you prefer? It's up to you. Some people like telephone calls, some people like email. I prefer email. But that's a question for another time. How can a monolith handle events? Can, cannot. Obviously can, la, otherwise I wouldn't be asking the question. <laughs> public subscribe. Can a monolith handle public subscribe? The answer is yes, but not alone. Monolith needs an external dependency. So you can do public subscribe with a message broker. And this message broker called NETS is written in Go. So it's a single binary. You take this single binary, run it, you get a message broker. You don't have to install anything, you just use that binary. So let's implement Publish Subscribe. You download, if you're using Windows, you download the Windows path, I'm using Linux. So you download that, gnetsd, and run it. Let's kill this, clear this. Run the message broker. It's called Go Nets Daemon. Go Nets D. Starting Net server, version 1.3, server is ready. That's it. No startup times like Java taking 15 minutes or whatever. It starts instantly. All right. So I have my message broker running in my system. I need to call a few things. I need to call Nets library. I need to tell Nets. Nets can use JSON. Nets can use plain text. Nets can use any type you define. But I'm going to tell Nets to use protocol buffers because gRPC uses by default protocol buffers. So I need to tell Nets to use protocol buffers. I'm using one of my own libraries called default, DFLT. And my generated protocol buffer arithmetic package. Again, it re I have two services, some service and load generator. So the main function is exceedingly simple. That's the entire main function. Print something saying I'm starting up. Load the sum service. Load the load generator service. And wait forever. Select, open, close, curly means wait forever. That's the simplest main function ever, right? Agree? Agree. So what does load generator do? It's, okay, here's some boilerplate. It's saying, please use protocol buffers. That's what it says. It's running in a Go routine. So it's a family inside the Rahaka roundhouse and generates two random numbers. Here's the thing that's different. It takes, it takes that request which I generated and publishes it. Publish means go to the megaphone and say, 
Hello, my request is A equals 2, B equals 3. I broadcast it. I don't care if anybody listened to my message. If nobody was in this room, I'll be like an idiot saying A equals 2, B equals 3. And the message is lost forever. Now, those in, people in philosophy class, if a tree falls in a jungle and nobody is there to listen, does it matter? Anyway, that's publish subscribe. The sum service is somebody in this audience listening out to the announcement. If somebody listens to the announcement, it says, okay, I will subscribe to that channel called, that broadcast called My Topic. And when I receive a message, I will run this function. I will run this function as a go routine. So if I receive a thousand messages all at once, I launch a thousand go routines. And a thousand go routines will be executing concurrently. Will be executing concurrently. And all it says is add two numbers. That's all it does. So let's run our messaging enabled monolith. Let's kill this old program. So let's run our messaging enable monolith. And what this monolith is doing is it's publishing a set of numbers, shouting out on, on a megaphone, 769 plus 8, 98, whatever. And something, another family in the same Hakka roundhouse, same monolith, is listening to their broadcast and responding. What do you think I happen if I kill the message broker? I take away his megaphone. I take away his megaphone. Let's take away the megaphone. Megaphone gone. The idiot's still publishing. He's talking about it, but no, no megaphone. So the people in the roundhouse cannot listen to anything. Right? If I give him his megaphone back, back. Do I have to restart anything? Do I have to restart the monolith? It's back. Right? Which do you prefer? GRPC, messaging, both has pros and cons. Up to you. It's not my job to say which is better, which is not so good. The next talk actually covers a little bit of this. So maybe some more pizza. But that is the Hakka Roundhouse Monolith. So in summary, by the way, if you want to run this for yourself, the code is downloaded. In summary, monoliths get messy because there's too much freedom. Monoliths get messy because there's too much freedom. We want Papa Mama to tell us to eat our vegetables. This Papa Mama, our parents, is called GRPC. GRPC enforces constraints to us to define our responsibilities clearly. Right? Once we define our responsibilities clearly, we don't have to use the remote procedure calls. We can just use the message types, all within a single monolith. As and when your needs grow, as they demonstrate that your growth, your boss says, we must scale this function because our business depends on it. Then you extract the service. And it's very easy to extract that service because you've defined it with GRPC in the first place. Right? So that is my talk. Thank you. Questions? Yes. So the, so the language itself can go to to create a lot of small functions there is a single monolith task and it, which is doing a lot of uh, in between small tasks. So I can create small uh, small uh, function snippets which can uh, do the... I'm, I'm very, very glad you asked that question. That's a topic that's the topic of my next talk, which is coming up soon. But how big should we make those functions? How big, yeah. how big is a microservice? Yeah. Is it a macro service or mini mini microservice yeah. with two lines of code or two thousand lines of code? Uh, next topic. So where do you strike the break even? Ah. Because there's this thing called the point of uh, like diminishing return. Ah, that's that's why I suggested. That's why I suggested to Tech Chun. I have a follow-up talk about exactly this topic. 
Uh, is there any more pizza? I think we should take a break. Everybody go and get some drinks and pizza and come back and we have the next stop. But before that, any more questions? Do you think this is usable in your environment? But you see how when you uh, disable the Mac server? Mm. Like, it's not that uh, when you try to publish the machine, it doesn't throw any error on it? Or you just like ignore that error? Uh, actually, it doesn't. There is no error at all. Because, remember a published subscribe system? If nobody is listening, I don't care. It's not an error. So in this case, if you, if you publish it, you wouldn't know if it's actually, like, it's, is it successfully sent to Mac or not? You know? It doesn't care because the model, as I said, is a megaphone yeah. and if somebody, if the megaphone fails, it's not an error because I'm still talking but nobody can listen. Okay. Now, what you ask is a very relevant question. Instead of a megaphone, can I, can I publish, can I publish the whiteboard so that it's written down? And the answer is yes. You can use Kafka, but I don't like Kafka. It's Java. <laughs> net streaming. Net streaming. As a relative of Nets, called Net Streaming, the two different products. But instead of a megaphone, you publish by writing stuff on a whiteboard. And the whiteboard is as big as your disk, as big as your memory. It can hold stuff forever. Or you can make a very small whiteboard and you hold stuff for one day or 10 seconds. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so the gRPC, uh, it maintains a registry for the function calls and what procedure calls? No. The question is gRPC, does it maintain a registry for function calls? It doesn't. There is no separate server. Where are all this, where is all this magic happening? It's happening here. Actually, it's not magic. You created it. It's in Everest Proto, the Proto file. You wrote a Proto file and you define everything. You are God. You are the programmer. And you told gRPC to create all these functions and stubs for me. So gRPC doesn't create something for you. It creates stubs for you, but doesn't, it doesn't run a separate service. So it's kind of a contract between those it's a contract document. It's exactly that. It's a the proto file is a contract document. Yes. So this means if you split this into different repo, right? So then it means you have to maintain two different proto files. Ah. Some time ago, I spoke to a developer from Google who was pro trying to promote gRPC and I, I asked him exactly the question. Where should the proto files be? It should it be in the same repo as your software? Or should it be in a separate repo? Well, for Go, uh, for Google, they only have one big repo. <laughs> but, um, but even though they have one big repo, it's in a specific place of the one big repo. So effectively, it's a separate virtual repo. Um, so his view is it should be in a separate place. I tend to share his view. These contracts should be given to a manager somewhere and locked away. Not locked away. Easily accessible, but separately maintained. So that uh, it's like if your child wants to learn how to drive and he doesn't have a car yet, Papa, can I have the car keys, please? You hold the car keys. Ah, son, go and drive or daughter, go and drive. So the ability to keep all the protocols with the father it's very important to maintain discipline. Because if you don't maintain discipline, what happens? Your monolith becomes a big ball of mud, unmaintainable. So I'm, like I said, the whole thesis of my talk is ex impose constraints on your monolith and it becomes sustainable suddenly, magically. Because you are practicing good parenting. If you don't, if you allow your kid to do anything it want, you want in the world, too much freedom, it's a modern world, he should be able to think for himself, do anything. Too much freedom leads to chaos. Good. Any other questions? If not, let's take a five minute break, come back in five minutes.